Thanks for being with us. Really happy to have so many of you with us today for this episode of This is CDR. For those of you who might be new to us, This is CDR is an online event series presented by Open Air to explore the wide range of carbon dioxide removal or CDR solutions uh, currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them for policy proposals that Open Air is advancing in New York, as well as other U.S. states and jurisdictions, as well as in Europe. Um, Please feel free to introduce yourself in the Zoom if you haven't already, um, and just let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from. I am Mega. I'm an Open Air member based in London, and I work on policy and market development. Um, quick background on Open Air, and Toby, if you're able to flip over to that slide, that would be great. Um, we are a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the responsible advancement of carbon dioxide removal solutions essential to solving the climate crisis, and our global, gr growing global community collaborates on shared open source missions in the areas of R&D, policy advocacy, and CDR market development. Um, I think Toby is putting a bunch of links in the chat, including some links to our website and to our Twitter, so please do follow and join us there. Um, and then this week, we're very pleased to welcome, uh, oh, sorry, dude, before I get onto that, um, we are launching the Carbon Removal Challenge, which is a way for students, um, you know, all over to get involved and just get hands-on experience with CDR. Um, I think Toby will probably drop in a link to how you can learn more about that. But if you're a student or you're affiliated with uh, some kind of academic institution, um, please do check that out if you might be interested in joining. Um, it's hosted by, uh, sort of organized by Matt Parker, who is one of the Open Air founders. Uh, and it's a really great sort of opportunity for students to get involved. Um, so yeah, if you or your academic institution are interested in participating, or if your organization would like to partner or sponsor on that, um, please do reach out to uh, someone at Open Air. Um, okay. And so this week we have with us Eva Chama, who is uh, the a po climate policy expert as well as the climate principal founder and managing director. And she's going to discuss the ongoing deliberations on carbon markets under Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, as well as their critical implications for the future of CDR. Um, our format today will be a little different if you've been here before. So we'll start with just a discussion between Eva and Open Air's Toby Bryce. And then we'll follow that up with moderated audience Q&A. Um, so as we go along, please type any uh, questions that you have into the Q&A box, um, separate from the chat box. So please type them into the Q&A one to just help us keep the, keep the questions organized. Um, we'll also be recording the event. Uh, so we will send the video link to all of you who registered. And we will also be posting it to Openair's website and Openair's YouTube channel. Uh, so Eva and Toby, whenever you're ready, uh, over to you. Thank you. Um, great to see everyone. Uh, Toby Bryce, based in Brooklyn, and I work on policy and market development with Open Air. And everyone, do please introduce yourself in the chat and direct that to everyone so we can see who's here and where you're zooming in from. And super excited to be here with Eva Tama um, to talk about uh, Paris Agreement, Article 6, and carbon markets. So thank you so much for being with us. Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me. It's very exciting and I think very topical and timely. Obviously, there's been a lot going on or uh, in the past several months relating to Article 6.4, but there's some larger issues that I think would be super interesting to learn more about. And I think that there are some also pending Article 6.4 deliberations that's really important for the carbon removal sector to be aware of and potentially interacting with. So that's what we kind of want to talk about today. So super excited to have you here and thank you. Um, before we get started, um, can you give us a quick introduction to yourself and who you are, where you come from, how you started doing this work? and um, Anything else you want to share with the audience before we dig into the topic? Sure. So hi, everyone. Uh, great to see so many people tune in. Uh, my name is Eva Tame, and I'm a climate policy expert. Um, this is something I've been doing for the last 20 years already. Um, I started out uh, actually working not uh, with the Paris Agreement, but with its predecessor, Kyoto Protocol. So I started out working on the offsetting projects under, under that regime. So I've spent uh, 15 years as a policymaker working on different elements of climate policy, but always also on carbon removals, sorry, always on carbon markets, removals kind of 
came up at some point during the Kyoto Protocol era, but now uh, we are completely in a different setting with the Paris Agreement. And uh, I have worked this whole time um, on both the international climate policy, which we are discussing uh, during this webinar, so under the Paris Agreement, uh, but also on the European climate policy. So indeed, 15 years as a policymaker in the national governments, in the European Commission, in the again, in representing the national government in, in Brussels. And now um, I'm running my own consultancy uh, called Climate Principles, where I focus specifically in three areas, which is carbon removal, carbon markets, and carbon capture. And obviously, there's a lot where these three areas are interlinked, and, and these are the areas that I also enjoy exploring. That's excellent. Thank you so much for that introduction. And if you look in the chat, we have links to a bunch of things that have a reference. I'm including her Twitter and LinkedIn, and I strongly encourage you to follow her in both places because <laughs> it's one of the best ways to keep in touch with these issues. Um, so I, I learn a lot from following Eva on, on online. So I, I encourage you to do the same. Um, just to like set the stage, um, and this is going to be very basic for you and um, but not for me, and I think possibly not for some members of the audience. Can you talk about what is the Paris Agreement and how does it relate to carbon removal? And then maybe we'll dig into Article 6 and the various provisions in there that are more specific. Yeah, so the Paris Agreement is basically the, the international treaty that governs the climate change mitigation um, it has been ratified by almost 200 countries, and they have agreed to achieve the balance between emissions and removals in the second half of the century. So basically, by, by setting such a target, the Paris Agreement in itself creates the need to increase removals. Um, and today we are, we are, and obviously to get there, we know that we need to substantially scale up removals over the coming decades because we need to have much more removals ready by the time we get to the net zero point or to net negative thereafter. And, uh, the, and the article six of the Paris Agreement. So that's one of the articles of the agreement, right? That specifically talks about carbon markets and some other mechanisms, but we will be we will be focusing on markets and then how these markets can be used to help reduce emissions and do carbon removal. So that's why Paris Agreement and, and, and removals are clearly connected. It's literally this international treaty that governs the, the whole system. So Paris Agreement is the larger framework for climate mitigation this century to reach net zero and other goals. And then within the Paris Agreement, Article 6 is the section that addresses the market-based solutions from a carbon perspective that help us will help us achieve that. Is that correct? It Indeed. I mean, it, it, it addresses market-based solutions, but there is also one part of that article that addresses non-market-based solutions, but that's not what we are going to discuss today. So we are going to talk about Article 6 from the market's perspective, like we're talking about it as the market's clause of the Paris Agreement. Helpful. Thank you. All right. So um, before we get to Article 6.4, I believe there's at least one other article that's worth kind of touching on, I believe 6.2. And are there any other non 6.4 aspects of the Article 6 that we should be talking about today? Well, I think the most important thing first to understand is why, um, what is the main goal of Article 6? Why do we have it in the Paris Agreement? Um, historically, uh, carbon markets were largely seen as a tool to do the most cost-effective climate change mitigation. In the context of the Paris Agreement, Article 6 and the markets under it are designed to help increase the ambition. So it's not about doing things cheaper, but it's about being able to do more than would be possible without using these tools. So ideally, countries who are using Article 6, they are able to uh, reduce more emissions and, and scale up more removals as a result of using these tools. So that's the driving force behind this. And sometimes this is kind of 
forgotten as as the main principle, but that is literally what it's what it's all about as a basics. Um, another element to bear in mind uh, before we get into the Article six point two and Article six point four which uh, sadly we don't have better names. We literally call these mechanisms like that. And I'm, I'm very sorry for it. You'll be hearing these basically for the whole webinar now. And uh, un until maybe at some point we end up with some kind of a more a communication friendly names for, for these mechanisms. Um, but Paris Agreement is basically built for the century. As I explained, it's about achieving the balance between emissions and removals. And and that means that we have really long term view under this treaty. In the past, when we had the Kyoto Protocol, we had a five year trading period, and then we had an eight year trading period, and and then there was the end to it, and then we got the Paris Agreement. So it was clearly kind of limited in time, and we kind of had this moment of reset between the Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement where we could really change things and how they work. And that also means we could change the rules how the carbon markets work because we had also carbon markets under Kyoto Protocol. We had clean development mechanism. We had the joint implementation mechanism. Um, and uh, we were and once we had established those, we couldn't really change the basic rules because it's a very complicated process to do that in this situation where you need to have a consensus of, of almost 200 countries. So the reset point where we were able to change the rules was by agreeing on the Paris Agreement and, and now implementing that. But now that we are at the point where we are establishing these rules under, under the Paris Agreement, we don't have any reset time or button coming up 10 years from now, 20 years from now. We are literally building these rules for these markets for the better part of the century, really to achieve that net zero and to go beyond. And that's why it is so, so important to get these foundational rules right, because in practice, we will just be building on these rules, but we are not going to go back and completely start changing something if, if we get it wrong. So something, so this is what happened with the CDM in the past, clean development mechanism. We got some things wrong, but we couldn't really go back to change it. So now, we really need to get it right because we're not going to have a take two at some point in the future, unless there will be some majorly big changes. We really have this treaty that will guide us over several, several decades to come. So that's why it's very important. And that's why Article 6 is very different from what we had before, in my view. A really um, important point, and I hope you know the the fact that that we do need to create a framework that can be flexible to accommodate future invention, future development changes. Um, I think is a really key insight. Um, so from here, do you want to do want to maybe I think we should focus on six point four, but do you want to give a quick yeah. background on six point two and any other relevant non six point four sections of Article six before we dig into six point four? So. Yeah, so let's talk. So we basically have uh, two mechanisms under Article 6 that are about markets. Um, so the first one, 6.2, is uh, a decentralized way of, of cooperation between countries. So both are about countries collaborating between themselves to achieve climate targets, or basically to raise the ambition of, of what they can do under their climate targets. Uh, Article 6.2 is decentralized. It's it can be linkages between emission trading systems of two countries. For example, if the UK emissions trading system and EU emissions trading system were to be linked, it would be something that falls under Article 6.2. It's also bilateral deals that countries are doing on carbon creating projects. Um, and I think uh, AITA has uh, actually a good link on, on their website where they are tracking uh, which countries have been doing deals with, which host countries are, are, are doing deals with... Uh, uh, with other countries to uh, to sell their credits. Uh, and it's very flexible because countries can just bilaterally agree on the terms of exactly how they're doing things. And then we have Article 6.4, which is a centralized UN-run mechanism. Um, so it's uh, it's very specific. It's much less flexible in practice. Um, but it's, uh, I would say... 
very important for removals because this is right now where the rules were is being de developed. And that's why I think today our main conversation is also going to be about 6.4 because that's that's where uh, that's what is most um, useful uh, for to follow on removals. I think another element to bear in mind is that 6.2 is already operational. Countries can use it. 6.4 is not operational because we need to first develop all the rules under it and get those agreed, and then we can you know start having projects under that mechanism. And when we talk about the 6.4, um, can you tell us a little bit about who is doing this? Um, the supervisory body and our friend Olga, who I think is doing an amazing um, <laughs> job at like it is our <laughs> feedback and indulging people like me and us. Um, but yeah, can you talk a little bit about how, the mechanism? Like how how is this? How are these rules being put together? So. The, this centralized mechanism is indeed run by the Article 6.4 supervisory body. Um, it is our friend Olga, who is the chair of the supervisory body. And uh, on their website, I understand you, you also, you got the link of the website. You will also see uh, all the, the other members of the, of the supervisory body. They're all there in their personal capacity. And uh, and they basically set the guidance, they implement procedures, they approve methodologies and standardized baselines, they register projects, issue credits, and many more things. I think useful for the audience to know is that methodologies under Article 6.4 mechanism uh, can be developed by very different types of stakeholders. So it can be developed by project participants themselves, can be developed by host countries, other stakeholders, or even by the supervisory body itself. So, uh, um, and, and any existing methodologies basically could be also submitted to be approved by the supervisory body uh, once the rules are in place and, and it's clear what kind of criteria this methodology will need to meet. And uh, I think important to know is that this work is not about removals, just removals. Removals is actually a very small part of their work, important part of their work, but they have so many other things that they're working on because it's not, it's about emission reductions and removals both, but the supervisory body is working on, on their activity standard, validation verification standard, activity cycles. I mean, there's so many accreditation standards, procedures, also recommendations and methodologies, and then recommendations on removals, which is the part that we are focusing on today. And many other parts also have clear ref relevance for removals, for example, the work that they're currently doing on methodologies, but it's just, uh, it would be too too deep to go uh, everywhere in detail. On removals, but I think that's a really good, you know, 90 plus percent of our, our mitigation work needs to be reducing emissions, and that will be a big part of Article 6.4. Um, can you talk a little bit about the I think no one was really paying attention to this until you raised the flag, uh, I believe it was in April or May of this year, um, and that kind of engaged the carbon removal community to pay attention to this because it's so important for the future of CDR. Um, can you talk a little bit about the the sort of trajectory with respect to carbon removal through these discussions and what happened earlier this year and kind of you know, maybe set the stage and then we can talk a little bit about what's happened since then and where we are now and what's going to happen next? Sure. Um, so it actually goes back to last year um, when the supervisory body, I, th it's, I think it, it started working last summer and it was around at some point last autumn, I think in September, October, when I realized that they are working on removals and no one is really following it. And also their discussions on removals indicate that they don't really have that much knowledge on removals. So I had a chat with uh, some of my colleagues in this community and I just told them, well, you know, it seems like there's such an important process and no one knows about this and no one also understands the process. So as a result of those conversations, actually I wrote my first blog post uh, together with uh, Paul Zakor from Carbon Counts on what is it, uh, what is this work on removals under Article 6.4, why is it important? And even back then, uh, last October, as a result of that blog post, I think it was almost 50 organizations that sent input to the supervisory body. And that in itself was already, it was so much more than we expected because it's such a, 
specific topic, uh, but it was great that it resonated that much. And uh, and now when we get to this spring and beyond, I will say Removal's community from already last year has been the most by far involved community in sending input to the supervisory body completely. Like, yeah, it's the scale of this has been so much bigger than the, the 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 work on removals actually under under supervisor body, but it's actually a good thing because as we'll get to later, the outcome of this we can clearly see because now their work is so much better informed and there's so much progress as a result of that. So that's that's a good thing. So um there was yeah the first kind of this is happening was something that came out last October, but uh, then a supervisory body had one task specifically on removals last year was to deliver these recommendations on removals for the COP for approval. And that didn't happen last year because they basically ran out of time. They only delivered like a three pager. Um, that uh, wasn't accepted for numerous reasons that I'm gonna not going to go into. And it was kind of sent back to the supervisory body and, and they were told, okay, take another year and come and come con con consult more, more with different stakeholders and come back with a better version of these recommendations. So this is basically that started happening this year now. There were wider consultations with wider set of stakeholders. And at some point in spring, I think in April, um, what I noticed was that there was one of the documents for the meeting that was about to happen that had very biased view on uh, on nature-based removals versus engineered removals, kind of uh, listing all the pros of nature-based removals and all the cons of engineered removals and kind of showing as that is the full picture, which of course is not. But that was a document which was a background document and developed by the secretariat. So it wasn't the supervisory body members who were writing it. Um, it, it wasn't the UNFCCC as such as an entity writing it. And, um, and so clearly there was, a, there was a glitch that, you know, wasn't supposed to happen. And if you look at how the process works, the, the proper way to address it was to send stakeholder input because that's what the process foresees. So I, when I kind of raised it, I got so many questions on this that I just had to take a Sunday and write out a blog post explaining what it means, what everyone should do, and um, the rest is history. I think we we got hundreds of uh, of inputs, letters. Um, and it was great how the whole community mobilized, but it was also, there were some negative situations as well. We, we got uh, people attacking supervisory body members who didn't do anything wrong. We had some media headlines that didn't do justice to what actually happened. But as a result, uh, what we needed to get out of it was just making sure that everyone had adheres to the process, the secretariat is neutral in their work. And uh, now obviously everyone knows that this work is under very strong scrutiny because, uh, and, and up until now, I would say, um, as a result of that, first of all, the ten-year accounting, which was questioned by uh, most of the stakeholder co community and none of the supervisory body members had supported it, was completely taken off the table. All the summaries the secretariat is doing on stakeholder input are now so much better balanced. So I think we kind of brought order into the system. And that doesn't mean, that's a question I oftentimes get, oh, but this big problem we have with removals under Article 6.4. Well, we don't have a big problem there. We had something in spring. I would say that was addressed. And now it's about the real thing that we want to get out of this work, which are these recommendations and removals, which is basically a document that sets these main principles and framework for how removals will be covered under the price agreements. Um, <clears throat> that was a lot, but that was very well articulated. And I will say again that, I mean, I think the 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 situation um, has, I would say, maybe it hasn't improved dramatically, but I think the the problems that manifested earlier this year have been, I think, largely addressed. And I, again, thank yeah. you for raising the flag. And I think, the, I'm not sure that it would have happened without you. And again, I also do want to give a shout out to Olga and the supervisory body. They really like, they they have bent over backwards to like create an open process. And I, it's been really amazing how receptive they've been to feedback. There are a couple questions in the chat. So we have been putting links in the chat and 
These links are going to go into a lot more detail than we have time and scope for here. There is a link, the link in particular, there's a link to um, Eva's uh, blog post on the topic. And if you start from the beginning, you will get a very good and detailed history of what's happened. Um, there's also a link to the, um, that Eva actually did, the, the Carbon Gap uh, 6.4 policy tracker entry. Um, and so there's a lot of really great background um, there. And, uh, and and also, if you go back through Eva's LinkedIn posts, a lot of these things are covered there too. So a couple of different ways you can get at this. Um, so let's talk about, you know, the big thing was, you know, the that information note, which again, would seem like it was kind of like not core to the actual supervisory body deliberation process, but really did raise a lot of flags. They were saying things like carbon, just blanket qualitative statements like carbon removal is incompatible with sustainable development and should not be um, implemented in the global south. So just statements like that, that were just like opinion. Um, and I think a lot of that has gone away. Um, can you talk a little bit about where we are now with the process and um, what the next steps are. And just the audience, um, we will be taking questions shortly. So please put those in the chat and we're going to get to as many of those as possible. But um, so where are we now? And like, what are the next steps? And if you are a CDR stakeholder, what do we need to be paying attention to? Or that will there be another important request for input or stakeholder comment? Um, so just talk a little bit about what mm -hmm. we can expect in the next, I guess it's two months because COP is in November. Yeah. So uh, there have been several uh, rounds of stakeholder inputs being asked already over the spring and over the summer. So I would say the biggest chunk of that has been done. And uh, as I always keep reminding everyone that the most important document that we should all be focusing on is on this, this, is this draft recommendations on removals. And we now saw for the first time a new draft on this in August in a run up to the uh, supervisory body meeting that uh, took place uh, now from 10th to 14th, to 14th of September in Singapore. And uh, so this was a document where the Secretariat had pulled input from you know more than 300 stakeholder submissions and condensed it into what at the time uh, before the meeting was, I think, 12 pages of actual text of recommendations, which during the meeting was condensed to nine pages. So we, I think we now have much better, much stronger basis, but there are still um, differences of views among the supervisory body members on some details. Uh, the last meeting saw a lot of discussions around reversals, how to mitigate the risk of reversals, what about buffer pools, insurance, what about sovereign guarantees, uh, is insurance alone without buffer pools enough, how to uh, make sure that all removals are equal, be they you know, engineered or nature-based. But I forgot to say in the beginning, Article 6 really covers all removals, uh, by default, it's everything, nothing is left out. So that's why it's important to get this framework right because it's it's meant to cover everything, but that's also what's making it so complicated because it has to work for very different types of removals. So this is the work that now was undertaken uh, in the last meeting in September. I think it was probably more than 10 hours of discussions only on removals. Um, so we have a shorter version of recommendations that came out of that. And the next step is that the last meeting before the COP is going to start on the 30th of October. And by that, we will see now a new version of draft, rec draft recommendations that will be submitted um, to that meeting for discussions. And I would expect that then a week before when a document comes out, the stakeholders can start sending uh, feedback to that document. So this is basically the point for removals community to look, is everything that should be there included? Is there anything uh, wrong that doesn't work for some removal methods, for example? This is the moment to voice it because uh, the next meeting is going to be the last one before COP, and this is where they have to agree on these recommendations and then forward them to the COP for approval. A um, couple things there. So number one, um, so, so I... I, th I think we didn't put it in our links. I'll try when um, during the audience QA, I'll try to find a link to the current draft of the um, draft recommendations. But it's from your perspective, I, there's a lot of detail, but at a high level in terms of creating a framework that will be 
has the opportunity to be method neutral criteria based such that things are not precluded uh, prima facie, like just by their by their nature. Do you think we are there currently unless the current draft changes? Well, there are still parts there that are not agreed, right? There are still parts there that are in square brackets. Um, so there are still decisions that need to be made. But I think we are, we have a solid foundation. I am very impressed by the work that has been done. Also, it's complete night and day compared to where the supervisory body was in their discussions last year at the same time versus this year. So much has happened. They've received so much input. I'm, I'm rather optimistic, to be honest, but we'll need to see how the version actually looks like that will go into the last round of discussions. And then, of course, we have to, you know, keep our fingers crossed that they actually manage to agree on those recommendations because the very, because we also, we need to get this mechanism operational. It has taken way too long to, to get there. So we need to have these recommendations approved by the supervisor body or agreed and then sent for approval at, well, I'm saying COP officially it's CMA, which is the abbreviation for the meeting of the parties of the Paris Agreement. But for the ease of understanding, it, it's happening during COP. So it's the same people there. So during the COP, uh, this is where these recommendations should be approved, and then we can actually start building on them. So, um, so mid October is kind of our next to do, and that's when the draft will be yes. draft will be released sometime in that time range. If we follow mm -hmm. you on Twitter and LinkedIn, you will let us know. Hopefully, probably, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, and um, and we need to review that and make sure that it looks okay. So, if you are a stakeholder, particularly a supplier, particularly a supplier of something that's not kind of one of the name brand like DAC or something, that's not you need to make sure that that you will be accommodated by these rules. Um, we've thrown out a couple acronyms. I just want to break them down. So, can you tell everyone what COP is, um, and then um, where it comes from, and when the next one is, and interestingly, where it is, and and that's. <laughs> Deliberations will be happening. Yes, COP stands for Conference of Parties. So these these are this is a conference of parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the UNFCCC, as I just spelled out. Um, and it happens so that it takes place uh, once a year, usually either in November or December. Um, and uh, the next one will take place in Dubai. And the one after, I think, is in Eastern Europe, if I'm not mistaken. So it changes. Um, there are there are groups of countries, uh, geographic groups that then kind of where it's rotating, and uh, it basically takes place in different parts of the world. And it's um, yeah, it's a huge event for first of all, the negotiations of implementing the price agreement as such, but also for everything that's happening next to it, all the events, all the announcements, everything that's happening around it, you know, tens of thousands of people coming together. So, And it, you know, Article 6.4 will be really important for that. So we will pay attention to that more generally for carbon yes. removal, just given everything that's going on and how like quickly the sector is advancing, scaling, um, it will be a really important forum for that as well. Um, Open Air has been involved with Carbon Business Council and a number of other partners, Carbon Gap, Rethinking Removals, and a, um, in a, in a project called Carbon Removals at COP. And we'll have an updated website for that and be sort of like trying to coordinate carbon removal messaging and events and everything else that's happening at COP. So um, we'll put a link to that in the chat, but it would be great to have everyone be part of that effort as well. A um, couple, we've touched on these topics, two two more questions, and then we want to um, leave plenty of time for audience questions, keep this coming in, and it looks like there's some really good ones. Um, number one, um, how does Article 6 relate to the current voluntary market and current voluntary market standards and methodologies that are, we're building the airplane as we fly it sort of in parallel? Like, how do we think about those? Because this is sort of a separate track, but they definitely relate to each other in certain ways. Can you talk about that for a minute or two? Mm. So if we look at what has happened over time, because it has been taking so many years to get the Article 6.4 mechanism operational, the voluntary carbon market kind of has come in to fill the gap so it's seen a bit of a gap filler there. So as I mentioned, uh, the methodologies uh, from the voluntary market can could be submitted for approval also under the 6.4 if they meet the criteria, right? Uh, but in reality, 
I see that um, we will not really end up having a voluntary market and then the compliance market. And then for some people, international markets are even something separate. For others, it's the same as compliance. Instead, we would rather have a voluntary supply that comes from maybe independent standards and we have compliance supply from governments and then we have the voluntary demand from the corporates and we have the compliance demand from countries to achieve their NDCs. And we will see the infrastructure of the voluntary carbon markets used in all these different settings and also compliance markets and international carbon markets used in all these settings. So it's basically kind of a web of, of different um, infrastructure and tools being used for different purposes. So it's going to be all mixed up. Yes, it's very confusing. The standards definitely relate to each other, though, and that's why this is so important. Um, yeah. No, just a quick sidebar audible question. Um, it's very complicated and confusing also, but what is your view on how corporate level emissions accounting rolls up or does not roll up to national level emissions accounting. And so like an article 6.4 market relates to, you know, Microsoft's emissions. Is there a simple way to think about that? Or is it just a big, big complicated mess? Well, it depends how deep you want to go. Um, basically, um, it's, so where to start? If you just ask about how the accounting ties together, uh, in reality, we, we don't really have clear nesting of corporate accounting in the national accounting, but national accounting, when it's being done, the information from corporates is being used in there. So there is no, and that's, that's basically the problem that we're facing. That's, I would say, the source of all problems and all these questions. Uh, the trouble is that uh, whilst there have been so many calls of trying to nest these corporate emissions within national emissions to have the clarity, we still don't have anything like that happening. And I'm not seeing the light in the end of that tunnel. So we are continuing in this world where these are two different systems. Um, but it's actually up for the governments to decide how they want to regulate any kind of corporate voluntary market projects in, in their territory. They can just say that, well, you can just do what you want in the specific niche that we give you. Or they can say that, no, you have to register and you can only do certain things and and we need to um, correspondingly adjust for these um, credits that are being issued and, and we need to, and you need to get all of this approved. So because the Paris Agreement is a bottom-up system, Every country can take different decisions. Of course, we are hoping that there will emerge kind of a climate club that approaches, approaches it in a similar way, and that would be helpful. But currently, we are living in, in an era where there are just different views on whether there should be this corresponding adjustment for voluntary market trades or there shouldn't be. And this two viewpoints, they just don't meet and there is no agreement. So you can talk to one, in one bubble where you hear that it makes no sense and you can talk in another bubble where they say, well, that's the only way. And we just, we, we don't have at the moment yep. a common understanding on this. I, uh, during the audience, can I'll find a recent blog post from Robert Hoagland on this topic that I'm not, it, it, it still confuses me. I mean, simplistically, it does seem like the corporate organizational level emissions should roll up to national and they're, they're separate systems and frameworks. But I know it's more complicated than that in terms of additionality and other multinational corporations and other issues. There is also another side to it, uh, which I think doesn't get enough attention. It's also the role of the voluntary market. Is it only to bridge the gap between national targets and where we need to get with the Paris Agreement? Or could it also be used at times to meet the national targets if we just have plain targets, but no actual implementation plans? Um, because I also keep hearing different views on this, and it would be helpful to have a bit more clarity here, because... Um, in some sense, if we have a powerful tool that could help, the most like immediate thing we need to get done is to achieve the climate targets that have been set, right? Yeah. But then also, how do we do it in a way that countries don't start saying, well, well, we just let the voluntary market do it and we don't put any policies in place. We need to get countries to put policies in place. But the challenge is that we are talking about economy-wide targets, 
there are not that many countries that have policies in place absolutely everywhere, and you can track very clearly how the targets are going to be met. So it's a very complex problem to solve. One, one last question, and, and maybe let's not drill into it too much so we get to the audience questions, but just at a high level. Um, and everyone also, please put your um, questions in the Zoom Q&A channel. We can't manage them if they're in the chat and we're not going to be able to get to them. So please put them in the Zoom Q&A channel. Can you just briefly kind of top line how you, we had Sebastian Manhart um, from Carbon Future on a couple weeks ago talking about a European policy update. There's a similarly really important process happening in Europe called the Carbon Removal Certification Framework. Um, can you just give a quick overview of what that is and how it relates to the Article 6.4 deliberations? Yeah, I'm just realizing that in my intro, I kind of forgot to mention all the different roles that I have. One of them is that I'm the member of uh, the European Commission expert group on carbon uh, removals, which specifically works on this uh, carbon removal certification framework. Uh, so the challenge is that we are having these two processes happening in parallel. We have uh, removals rules being developed under Article 6.4, and we have them being developed in the EU under the Carbon Removal Certification Framework. And uh, I, I tend to get questions, you know, who should learn from whom, or who is further ahead, or who will be there first. And it's very difficult to say because the basic framework, um, okay, maybe the UN will be will be a bit ahead if they adopted that COP and the EU will get that in place maybe in March if we are successful. But then putting the, the rest of the infrastructure in place, uh, developing methodologies, which the EU is actually going to develop themselves. There is going to be one methodology for each carbon removal method. Uh, really developed then by the commission versus under article 6.4, you can have many different methodologies, right? There is, there's no explicit limits. I think it's really difficult to say who will be moving faster in this context. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, thank you so much. I, you really did a great job of kind of um, breaking down a very complicated set of questions in a way that people can understand it. And thank you also for all the amazing work you've done to highlight these issues and explain them to people. Um, it's really been a pleasure to talk to you. Um, Mega is going to come on now. We have some great audience questions and we're going to start hitting you with some of those. But thank you. Well, yeah. Um, well, we got quite a few questions about sort of, uh, I guess, corresponding adjustments and whether or not there is double counting between national and corporate uh, targets. I know you touched on this a little bit, but could, could you maybe just walk us through like what the overall issue is, what is a corresponding adjustment, and then what part of it is and is not governed by the Paris Agreement or Article 6? Well, the, because... Uh, now under the Paris agreements, all countries have climate targets, right? So if they do a trade between them, or one of them, let's say, um, well, we take the example, like the only specific re removal specific example that I know, although this, like they're still discussing that maybe it will never happen. So that would be, for example, uh, Switzerland buying direct air gas credits from Iceland. So, um, if Iceland would be selling these credits to Switzerland, then Switzerland will use these against their climate target, but Iceland cannot use the same, um, in this case, removals against their climate target. So they have to adjust their emission level accordingly to, to make clear that, that they're not doing it. So that's what we call corresponding adjustments. We are correspondingly adjusting um, making sure that there is no double counting. Uh, the question is if now there are going to be use cases, for example, uh, in the in the voluntary markets. So there is a project happening in, in one country and, and someone from a different country is buying these credits from the voluntary markets. Uh, should uh, there be a corresponding adjustment? Because in this case, it's not another country using it, it's actually another corporate using it. The reality is that it's the host country who has the power to decide on it. And we can go into the discussions of whether it makes sense, whether it doesn't make sense, how it should be approached. I'm a big believer, like in my advisory work, I give fact-based advice. We can always talk about what should be, but the facts are that it is up for the country 
and we we don't have any other agreed way of of going about it and countries can decide different ways about it and and then there are these different viewpoints some think that it makes no sense others say that corresponding adjustments makes perfect sense others say that well they might make sense but not right now but later but in the end it is really for the host country to decide no matter what we discuss makes sense yeah, definitely. And I mean, do you think there's any way that this incentivizes, let's say, a host country to then pass on the incentives to companies to buy carbon credits? Like, is that one way that this could sort of take effect or is that sort of too theoretical? To buy? Mm, I mean, sometimes countries establish agencies who will do buying for them, right? Uh but I, I guess what you mean is, is something different. Countries can come up with all kinds of concepts in this. I don't think there are any limitations. It's just a question of how they will then tie it together with their national regulation and then the whole like international Article 6 framework. Yep. Okay. Makes sense. And then um, someone also asked if the European carbon border adjustment mechanism will play any role in the way these things are allocated. Do the two interact at all or are they kind of considered separately? I don't see a clear interaction there. No. But uh, the, the only thing is that, uh, I mean, the carbon adjustment mechanism will push more countries in putting a price on carbon uh, which right. should help with decarbonization in general, and which should help with achieving the Paris Agreement targets. Well, Paris Agreement goal is it is a temperature goal, if we are being specific here. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, okay, just thinking about the process, um, we had a question saying, why don't we see more responses from the, the parties themselves in the process? And would this mean that the, the outcomes might change significantly at COP or at the CMA? Uh, responses on this supervisory I think body the, work? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think there were eight countries. Well, I call them officially their parties because some of them are uh, supranational entities like the EU, but most of them are countries. Uh, so there were eight countries sending input, I think, uh, during the uh, consultation that was that ended, I think, in March. So indeed, not that many, eight, uh, eight out of almost... 200. I don't think removals are yet really at the forefront of the thinking by countries. I do think that the global stock take that now is happening and will culminate at, at COP28, it should bring uh, a much stronger focus on removals and should ideally lead to more specific uh, inputs also by countries in their NDCs in explaining how they plan to go about removals. But in terms of the Article 6.4 process, um, well, it's obvious that supervisory body members themselves, although they are in the supervisory body in their personal capacity, they... Um, they mostly work, well, they work in, in, in different places, but many of them work also in the governments. So there is knowledge there through that. Um, but indeed, there, there could be more inputs. But I don't think it has... Okay, maybe last year that was that added to the reasons why the recommendations were pushed back. But I mean, it was just three pages. It just like wasn't enough to really agree. And there wasn't enough consultation with civil society groups. It just was never going to happen. But I think this time around, countries are more at least aware of this process. So I don't see the fact that we had only eight countries submit something on this, uh, on the removals under Article 6.4, uh, leading to... A problem. I I hope I'm proven right. <laughs> and do you think there are sort of lessons to be learned from the way that this went? You know, you posted this uh, really great blog post, brought attention to it, and as you yeah. said, people really mobilized quickly. Do you think there's you know a lesson in there as to how we can continue to sort of move advocacy forward on these issues, um, and particularly particularly I think advocacy towards the UN, which is not the most uh, transparent sort of process to, I think, most people. Well, 
what we needed to do in that specific moment is to say that like what we saw was not okay and it should not happen again. I think such a strong reaction sent that message very clearly. I highly doubt that we will see another background paper somewhere trusted by the Secretariat that tries something similar. Uh, I'm sure it, 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 these discussions didn't take place only on the working level, also in the Secretariat. I'm sure those discussions went up higher and uh, it's clear the Secretariat has to be a neutral player. I think the whole exercise uh, increased a lot the understanding on the process of uh, Article 6, Article 6.4, what the supervisory body is doing, what is being built. And that is amazing. I think it's just important to keep feeding into the process, keep following the process, um, sign up for the newsletter. I'm sure you have already shared the link, right? Um, this is something yes. where last year, the supervisory body, it was difficult to even really be aware when something was happening because it was just a press release from the UN. And unless you knew, you kind of, you were like, it was impossible for someone from the outside to realize that this process was happening and these meetings were taking place. Now the supervisory body has completely embraced, you know, stakeholder consultation, stakeholder interaction, special webinars, newsletters, mailing lists, like all kinds of things. I think we're living a different reality. So I don't think we should go ahead thinking that something suspicious is always happening. I think it was a one-off situation and we needed to address it, that it was important. But it's not something that we should continue kind of bringing with us as, oh, but there is this big problem under Article 6.4. Like that problem that we had was actually fixed. And I think we should move on from there and now really look at what is in this draft recommendations and work on this content and obviously always keeping an eye on everything else as well. But let's not kind of stay stuck in what happened half a year ago. That's that's my message. Okay, great. Um, just, I think probably two more questions before we go. Um, do you have thoughts on the way some things outside of CDR are going to be treated? And I think the two we got were, uh, will points or CCOS be treated similarly? And then uh, methane, is that kind of, I know we've, you've talked a little bit about um, what sort of explicitly included or not, um, but going beyond CDR, uh, how are those two considered? Mm. So methane was now, was it mentioned in terms of reducing methane emissions? Because there were also conversations at the last meeting about removing methane from the atmosphere, right? That also came Yes, up, I think this, this question was about removals, actually. Um, I, I, I mean, we'll need to see how the, 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 the next version of the draft recommendation looks like. But I understand the idea was to bring in the definition of anthropogenic greenhouse gas removals, which makes kind of clear that it's not only CO2. And then there's going to be the definition of carbon dioxide removal. But basically, the the recommendations wouldn't close the door of being able to remove also other greenhouse gases once you know the, the methods mature enough and we can actually do it in practice. Uh, when it comes to uh, point source CCS, when we don't mean BEX as a point source, then um, so CCS as an emission reduction technology, I mean, obviously, under the Article 6.4, um, we there are modalities and procedures for CCS also from the Kyoto Protocol era, but no methodologies that would be kind of directly brought over. Um, but yes, Article 6.4 rules will be applicable for, for all these emission reduction projects as well, and, and CCS would be among them. Okay, got it. Um, maybe just one or two more then. Um, in terms of sort of timing, and I think this uh, is based on someone's input to the supervisory body uh, by Ben Groom and Frank Benmans, which talked about the social value of an offset and basically said that, you know, an offset or a removal or a reduction that happens today is more valuable than the same amount happening in 10 years or down the line. Um, is there any accounting for sort of the value of things happening sooner rather than later? And what are your views on, on that idea? Um, so... This is something that 
came up in a way also in the last supervisory body meeting because what they are discussing is that, for example, if there would be a reversal, then it would need to be replaced by a credit that has the same vintage. So they are rather looking at it from the vintage perspective because of that exact climate impact, because there is it is a, it is different whether uh, whether you reduce emissions and today or 10 years from now or the same with with removals. So in, in vintage context, it, it's coming up in, in, in that work as well. Okay, got it. Um, and then I think uh, probably the last one then. Um, do you think, uh, are there any like historical predecessors for a market, you know, a centralized UN market looking like this? Um, and is there something we can learn from that for getting carbon removals and carbon markets to work on the same way? Or is this a totally unprecedented um, way of trying to do things? You mean for removals? Well, we yeah, like has it has this ever been tried before to create kind of a global market for something like this and to trade in this way? Well, in general, we we had carbon markets. I mean, that's how I got started, right? Twenty years ago, working on uh, these were emission reduction projects. Um, so I'm Estonian, so we had projects where uh, we built wind farms and then Finland got the carbon credits from the reductions of those wind farms. So we have clean development mechanism under Kyoto Protocol, we have joint implementation under Kyoto Protocol. Uh, we even had the experience with track one joint implementation, track two joint implementation, which in my view are a bit similar to track one with article 6.2 and track two with article 6.4. Um, the challenge here is not really with the main infrastructure, but uh, when it comes to removals, it's really how to tackle the durability and reversals and monitoring, and then who will be liable for reversals very long time afterwards, let's say 100 years from now. These are the conversations we never had in building car carbon markets before, because with reducing emissions, usually it's very straightforward. They were reduced, full stop. Great. I think um, that's kind of the end of our time. Thank you so much for being with us, uh, Eva. And Toby, if you don't mind putting up the slides, um, if you're able to do that, I can just go through what's coming up next week, um, or rather in a couple of weeks from now. So I think we're off next week, um, which fortuitously uh, coincides with Carbon Undone for anyone who's in London. Um, would love to see you there if you're around. And then we've got a bunch of great things coming up. So two weeks from today, Stockholm Exergy, and then I won't bore you with reading them all, but you can see who we have coming up. Um, so please sign up for this one uh, on October 10th with Eric Rylander. Um, the ones coming up after that, uh, there may be event rights for some of those, so please sign up for those as well. Um, and yeah, as I said before, please check out the Carbon Removal Challenge. Um, and otherwise, I'll hope to see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.